at this morning. We are going to discuss prayer this morning a little differently than what you might be used to, but we got some um, a lot of scripture that we have to kind of rip through this morning. Uh, keep in mind, one, we're doing our small group signups right now, right out there in the commons area. If you're looking for a small group, we have several small groups that'll be taking place on Sunday nights at six o'clock, starting this first Sunday in October. So we don't want you to miss out that. We also have the marriage uh, small group that's going on Wednesday nights at seven o'clock. All that's out there in the commons area. Please check that out when you get a shot. Um, let's pray and we're gonna dive into the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that you're an awesome God that you stand sovereign over everything. Quiet our hearts, give us peace and comfort. Help us to lay down any unforgiveness. Help us to lay down our worries and our concerns. Help us to seek your face and to love you more. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray, amen. amen. We're going to 1 John chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, if you don't, we have it on the screen for you. No judgment here to your face. We'll judge you when you leave. <laughs> 1 John 5. First John 5, and let's do, uh, well, it's all good, um, 14, 1 John 5 and 14. This is our last uh, sermon from 1 John, so hopefully you've been stu uh, studying on your own time um, with your own um, time with God. Um, there's a lot that we could get into here, the rest of 1 John 5 that we're not, we're going to talk about prayer. That's where I feel as a pastor we should land ourselves, and that's what we're going to do here. And it says this. And this is the confidence that we have towards him. Him is God the Father, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, okay? And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Good stuff. Uh, so uh, I hang out a lot with a, a friend of mine. Uh, he's like 5'2", African-American kid named Murray Satterfield. Where's Murray at? Stand up so they can see you. Y'all may not see him if he stands up. Where's he at? Oh, he's right here. I'm sorry. He's right here. Okay, yeah. And so uh, I hang out with him a lot. And, and so when we're hanging out, he asks me some of the worst random questions you could ever ask somebody. He'll ask me, when did we go to the moon? And I'm like, I don't know, man. Google it. Google it. I tell him to Google it. And, and I'm telling y'all now, don't ever have Murray Google anything. Feel it's terrible. It's, all right, go find out what year we went to the moon. By the time he's done, he's looking at camels in Egypt and he's showing me videos of these people in Egypt riding cam. What does that have to do with the moon, Murray? I don't know, man, but he's some cold-blooded camels, man. Check him out, some cold-blooded camels. He just gets on Google and he just, he can't Google and I'm learning that everybody can't Google. Everybody can't Google. Some of you can't Google. Some of you cannot get on Google. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what to look for. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 but Google is like an, a verb now. Everybody knows what Google is. If you don't know what Google is, you are old, period. There's no argument. That's not mean. That's straight truth with no chaser. You're old if you don't know what Google is. That's not mean. That is truth, all right? And every, we, we all Google, we all get on there and we're looking. We all want answers, amen? Everybody wants the answer to their questions. We all want answers. So we're constantly Googling. It's a verb now. It's in the dictionary. If you're not Googling, you're awesome. You know, it's, you, I was thinking about doing a research paper back in the day and you remember those little things you had to pull out and go through the little cards and you had to know the Dewey Decimal System. Them days are gone, man, the Dewey Decimal System. I never learned it. I never knew where the animals were. I never knew the science. I didn't know any of that stuff. And, and then you go to the library and you look through periodicals. Remember that? Them days are gone, man. Just Google it. And if it's on Google, it's true, right? If it's Google, it's true. Every quote is true. Every statement is true. Every statistic is true. We all want answers to our question. It's very human to want your questions answered. Getting our questions answered is how we learn, amen? Yeah. Curiosity, you want your questions answered. Everybody wants their questions answered. And so Google has leveraged humanity and taken advantage of the one thing that everybody on this planet has in common. We all want answers. And James is talking to the church here. He's the last living apostle. He's Jesus's BFF. He's like his best friend. He's the last living apostle. He's the last one that was under Jesus' leadership that touched Christ 
The church was in crisis mode. It was a difficult time for the church. Some people who started off with them were no longer with them. There were some believers who started off fired up about Christ. Things got difficult. They'd fallen off. They had all these strange teachings going on. Not everybody was teaching what Jesus taught. And John is trying to bring things to kind of a crescendo. There's a lot of unanswered questions. There's a lot of questions that need to be answered. And John is saying, listen, if you don't have your questions answered, if you do have questions you can be you can pray and you can be confident when you pray and John is encouraging the church and those who love Jesus Christ that when you have questions and when you have some need of answers God hears you he is listening he is listening and the reality is we all want to be heard and so social media has leveraged that everybody's on there it's your chance to be heard you can post it you can tweet it you can wordpress it you can do all these different things so that you could be heard so it's very human to want to have your question answered it's very human to want to be heard and John is saying not only can you ask the question to God God hears you say amen church do you don't always feel that way you don't always feel that way. And, and, and I'm going to say this as, as politely as possible because it's, I'm talking to myself. No is an answer. And if you're a parent, you smile because you understand that as a parent. But you also have a heavenly parent who also knows no way better than we could ever know. No. <laughs> no, no. You know what I'm saying? Like he knows no better than any of us. And there are prayers that God absolutely refuses to say yes to. And I think it's interesting when we get the diagnosis and then we go back for our second checkup and we're all praying, we say, God answered the prayer when it goes the way that we want it to go. And I'm gonna challenge you this morning to rethink that, that even when it doesn't go the way you want it to go, God still answered the prayer. And coming to that place where we're at last week in Isaiah 55, where his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and he knows the story within the story within the story within the story that you have no clue about. And coming to that place where we start to admit that we don't even really know what we really need and stop trying to play experts over our own life and understand that talking to God has more to do with you not just making a list of requests, but there's like a control alt delete thing going on that God has reset in your heart. Yes. So I'm going to challenge you to pray and call on him because he hears you. Jeremiah 29, 12 says, then you will call upon me, come and pray to me and I will hear you. And everybody always knows Jeremiah 29, 11. We love that verse. I know the plans for you. I say the Lord, if you read the whole chapter of Jeremiah 29, you, that may stop being your favorite verse. If you really understand the context of that chapter, that may stop being your favorite verse. They were being beat up. They were being beat down by the culture. And God said, not only do I want you to stay in that culture, not only do I want you to stay in that land, I want you to seek the prosperity of that land. And when you get frustrated and when you get tired and when you start feeling beat up, I know the plans I have for you. And then you can pray and I will hear you. And that's a promise that we got to ask the Holy Spirit to increase our confidence about. That when we're talking to God, he hears us. And what you really need is not for you to get what you want. What you really need is this relationship with this Holy Father who loves you and who hears you. That is what you need. You need to understand that no matter what you're in, Christ is with you in your crisis, in your moment. Christ is right there with you. And when you pray, it reminds you, it enriches you, and lets you know that no matter what you're facing, God in you is greater than what you're against. Amen? Amen? He's greater than what you're against. Amen? Sometimes we are distracted by a few things in prayer. There are some things that take away from our confidence. Sometimes the way that we're living takes away from our confidence. You've been living recklessly. And you're like, well, I don't want to talk to God now. I haven't been living right. I've been mean, I've been doing whatever it is that I'm doing, so I don't want to talk to God. So sometimes our lifestyle keeps us from talking to God because you just don't feel like you've been living right, but you will never come to a place of living right till you humble yourself before the Almighty Lord and talk to Him. Right. Your living right starts with you talking to your father. And the prodigal son was out there, he was doing whatever he wanted, 
and however he wanted to do. And it wasn't until he came to the Father that things were set right. And so you're trying to set things right this morning. You're trying to get things back this morning. If there, About a third of people that are missing right now are missing because they think that they're not living good enough so they don't come to church. They think they'd be a hypocrite if they're living recklessly and they show up for church. But I'm just telling you, until you come to the Father and let the Father direct your path, you're not going to get it right. Some of us get distracted or get a barrier for us to prayers. We don't know how to pray. We feel like we don't pray right. You don't know, beseecheth thou with cometh father oh heavenly father if you would just cometh down and you don't know king james version talk and you say i can't pray man it's just awkward i don't know what to say if you don't know what to say if you don't think you have the right words it's not about the language that you pray in it's not about saying it a certain way god is smart he knows what's in your heart he knows what you're trying to say when you don't know what you're saying he wants you to talk to him it's not that god would not know the information without you telling him this is for your good not his that you talk to him this is for your good not his that you talk to him he's not asking you to talk to him because the father doesn't know what's going on with you your very hairs on your head are numbered by god i don't mean counted i mean numbered if hair number 1175 fell off your head and blew the China, God would be able to pick up and go, this is DJ's, well, not quite 1,000, 175, but this is DJ's fifth hair. Bless his heart. He knows everything about you. So you talking to him has nothing to do with you, like you're going to inform God about something that's going on in your life. It's for your good. He made you. He's your creator. He knows how you're wired. He knows what you need. And he's saying, you need to talk to me. Even if you don't know what to say, Talk to me. J.C. Rowell, the famous theologian, has a quote, and it says this, and I quote, Fear not because your prayer is stammering, your words feeble, and your language poor. Jesus can understand you, end quote. Jesus can understand you. So if you're a young person in here, and you don't know how to say a good prayer, and somebody says a prayer, and you're like, fist bump, hey, man, you rock that prayer. There's no such thing as rocking a prayer, really. It's talking to God, young people. It's just talking to the Father. And John is telling all believers, you can be confident even when you don't get the words right and even if you've kind of been living a certain way that's counter contrary to scripture, if you repent and turn back to Christ, you can be confident the Father hears you. So I got two things I want you to do that is not nothing to do. I want you to believe when you pray that God hears you. I don't want you to necessarily worry about what you think you need Whatever you write down to pray for, I want you to believe that God hears you. I want you to be confident that God is listening to you when you pray. We talk a lot about content. We talk about a lot what prayer is, and very rarely do we land in a place of belief. And our church tradition is Baptist, and in general, Baptists are very practical. They're very hands-on, and even Baptists forget that there's a Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can do things that we can't do as human beings. And when the Holy Spirit is busy, he can accomplish far more and exceedingly more than we could ever ask or think. And if we would just believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, more can get done in five minutes of the Holy Spirit than what we could do infinitely. And we got to learn to just believe first. We got to learn just to believe. And we just start spitting out prayers and we don't even ask, do I even believe God hears me? And I want you to learn to be a being, not a doing. We are human beings, not human doings. We've got to learn that we need help with our being. My being needs to be changed. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature, that Jesus Christ come to die, that you may have a new being. He doesn't want you to try to behave first and that change your being. Your doing doesn't change your who, it's who you are that changes what you do. That's the world's way. The world's way is like do a bunch of stuff and then you'll change. But Christ says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, all of you who are heavy burdened, all you who are beat up by life, and I will give you rest because I'm going to change you from the inside out. And if you let him change your being, your behavior will take care of itself. You'll do it from your being. And I don't want anybody to get confused, but I'm telling you, to do things because you want to make an impact is not the kingdom. We want to make an impact, and it's only God who can cause us to make an impact. We do what we do because this is what we do. Dogs bark because dogs bark. Kingdom citizens help the poor because kingdom citizens help the poor. Kingdom citizens reach out to others. Kingdom citizens love the unlovable. That's our being. That's what we do. We're not doing it to make ourselves feel. I feel so good giving those kids chili. It's not about you feeling good. 
Sometimes that's a byproduct of obeying God is you will feel good, but the kingdom citizen loves people on the margins because the Holy Spirit has changed their being and wakes you up and go, it's not all about you. Amen. Amen. Some of you are sick because all you do is think about yourself. Selah, pause for a moment. You got to get your mind off of other people's business and get your mind on God's business. Glory to God. <laughs> it's a small town. They don't like to hear that, kids. They don't like to hear that. <laughs> you got to think about God's business and how the Holy Spirit can change your being so you can get in on the Father's work. And so that, I believe that starts with believing. Psalms 34, 17 says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears them and delivers them out of all their troubles. Do you believe that God hears this morning? Do you believe that he hears your voice, that he knows your language? Acts 12 and 5, Peter finds himself in jail, and he's jailed for preaching the gospel. The church was very concerned about him being in jail. And the Bible says in Acts 12 and 5 that Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So you're seeing the church step up while Peter is in prison, and they are earnestly praying for him devoted, committed to praying for Peter while he's in jail. Some angels end up coming and bust him out. That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Like, I don't know what music is playing in the background after that. But that's pretty awesome. They bust him out of jail and Peter goes free. But the church was praying. So not only do I want you to believe, but I want you to invite others in on what to pray for in your life. That as a church, we're supposed to be praying for one another. And we live in a small town, so that's difficult because some people just confidentiality just eludes them. They just don't know how to be confidential and you get your business on the street. But the reality is God did not create you and make you and wire you to do life by yourself. He's actually calling you to get in on it with others and allow them to pray on your behalf. And so the, one of the roles of the church is that we pray for one another. And so you, if you were like looking at James uh, 5, 13, you're gonna see that prayer really matters in James. And, and, and James has given some instructions here to the church. And he's making it clear that if y'all don't pray for each other, people are gonna be sick. People are gonna be hurting. People are gonna be destitute. 5.13 says, is there any man among you suffering? Let him pray. It says, if you're suffering, you first pray for yourself. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. He didn't say the pastor per se. He said, the elder church, find some mature believers, circle them around you, and let them pray over them. So if you're sick, you don't keep that to yourself. You find some mature believers, and you believe that God is going to hear all of you when they pray for you. You let others share in your suffering with you. God did not make you as a kingdom citizen to suffer alone. And some of you don't have any confidence that God hears you because you never pray with anybody else but yourself. And you gotta get out of your comfort zone. You gotta get out of your convenience zone. You gotta get out of your awkwardness. You gotta get out of all that silly stuff and say, okay, I believe that when we come together and pray, God hears us. He will respond. And so I want to encourage you not just to believe that God answers prayers, but invite somebody in on that prayer. Invite somebody in. Find three or four mature believers and let them pray with you. And James builds his case in 5.13. He says, and the prayer of the faith, and the prayer of faith in the 15th verse will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. There's nothing wrong. Baptist church, there's nothing wrong with praying for healing. There's nothing wrong. Praying for healing is not a Pentecostal thing. Praying for healing is a, praying for healing is a believer thing. God still heals. Yes. He still takes care of his kids. You pray for healing. You believe. Don't let some, some people are so fundamental. They think it's silly to trust that God can take care. God can take care of sickness. He says, get the whole church involved. Get some elders involved. 17th verse says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And I figured out this is like Elijah. See, see God can give that to Elijah. He couldn't give that kind of power to me because I would be messing with y'all for the fun of it. I'd be like, what'd you say, Rayburn? It's not going to rain for three and a half years, Rayburn. What'd you say? 
<laughs> Elijah must have been a humble guy. Didn't reign for three and a half years. And then you look at uh, 18, then he prayed again. And heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. So like one minute he's praying and he said, you guys tired of that? You guys tired of the drought? All right, I'm going to pray and take the drought away. It's like, wow. And Elijah's just a man like us. And I know he's a man like us. You know how I know? Because a few verses later, he gets depressed and he prays that God will kill him. I know he's a human. I know. I said, this dude is an American. One minute, you're praying for rain to stop and it stops. Next minute, you're praying for rain to come and it comes. You're on top of the earth. The next minute, <laughs> and he prayed a prayer that God would kill him. God did not answer that prayer. He prayed that prayer and God did not answer that prayer. He answered the one with the rain. He answered the one without rain, but he didn't answer the prayer that was in his depression. So you need to know this morning that it's not about whether or not you get what you want or God does what is in our little bitty heads, what we think. It's about you talking. What you really need is to talk to the Father and you really need to believe while you're talking to the Father and then you need to invite others in to talk to the Father with you. And that's something that this church here, if you're a visitor here, God bless you, I'm not talking to you. If, but if you're not a visitor, you're a member or attender here, that's something that we could do better at. I didn't get one amen. You see that, Taylor? They went quiet. We could do better at praying together. It's, it's hard to fight somebody that you pray with. It's hard to gossip about somebody that you pray with. It's hard to be mean spirit to someone that you pray with. And some of you have beef because you don't pray enough together. If you would just spend, when you pray with somebody, you trust them and you assume better than you assume worse. When you don't pray together, you typically will, your flesh will go assume the worst, think the worst, believe the worst. But when you pray with somebody, you're less likely to do that. This church is big enough, you can sit across the room and pray for somebody that you disagree with on the other side of the room. You don't have to sit by them. I'm not saying you have to sit by them and go to the skating rink every weekend. We don't need any broken hips in here. But, uh, <laughs> so I want you to believe. I want you to invite others in on your prayer. And then my last request this morning is to endure in prayer. I want you to believe. I want you to invite others in on the prayer. And then I want you to endure in prayer. I want you to have some endurance. I want you to understand that sometimes, man, you're praying and 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 some people aren't laughing because they know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not funny to some people because tears roll on their pillow and they just keep praying and they just keep praying and they just keep praying and they just keep praying. And then y'all look at us like we're something special and you think there's something wrong with us because you don't know why we're smiling and why we're enduring. It's because we talk to the Father who's over everything, yeah. every day, constantly. We're enduring in relationship with him. We're not special. Just get on the bus, dude. Dude. <laughs> This is a devotion that should happen in prayer. And I'm, I'm just going to tell you, you guys are going to fire me eventually because I'm fully committed to this. I spent two whole days last week. just I did nothing. I just prayed. It, this running around, meeting with everybody and trying to be in y'all's faces. You, you, this church needs somebody praying. The jacked upness in this little small city is ridiculous. And if y'all want to pretend like this is a great place to raise your kids and nothing's wrong, God bless your hearts. God bless your hearts. You have a, you, you, you're not in the real world. You got North Korea. I mean, I'm like, man, this is like, I could get up here and do last day's preaching, Jonathan. I get up here and go, with North Korea, there's earthquakes and hurricanes and diverse places in North Korea and Russia. And, and you'd be like, Jesus is coming back. Everybody would get saved in here too if I said that. I could prove it. In the last days, I could just make this place real scared because you're looking at the news. It's overwhelming. We have to endure in prayer. We have to endure in prayer. Devoted, steadfast. It's Acts 2.42, the church is coming together. The church was built on devotion to prayer. The reason why you're in this room is because the first group of believers were committed to prayer. 
Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves. That word means steadfastness to the apostles' teaching. They devoted, they devoted themselves to the word of God. They devoted themselves to fellowship. This is why it's so important. I know some of you just don't get it. Some of you just don't get it. You refuse to get it. You need other believers. You absolutely need to come around other believers. You just don't get it. And we think that because there's no bloods and crips here, there's no gangs here, there's no real strong biker gang presence. We really, this is the most dangerous place to live because evil can be in your heart. You can be a horrible person and you would never know it. This is one of the most, you could be selfish and greedy and because, you know, the homeless here are the same old homeless and the poor people are the same old poor people, your heart could become so hard, you would never know that you're greedy, backbiting, absolutely opposite of the cross, unforgiving. And the most dangerous place about living in these towns is you can just cross your arms and look indignant at other people and think you're better. And when you pray, the Holy Spirit doesn't allow you to do that. When you pray, it makes you go, man, I got to get around God's people. Got to eat with them. They committed themselves to breaking the bread and they committed themselves to praying together. That's the church. We can come here and sing songs, hear a message. I can make you laugh. But if we're not focused on God's word together, if we're not fellowshipping together, if we're not eating together, and if we're not praying together, that's not church. You can come into a building, call the building a church, but what's going on here is not church. Right. And I'm passionately and begging you, especially you young people. Not, I'm not even talking about teens. I'm talking about you 25 to 40-year-olds. You've got to change your lifestyle and make prayer and God's people a priority. You've got to change your lifestyle and make prayer and God's people a priority. you got to start saying, you know what? I love the Chiefs. I'm glad they beat New England, but they're not a priority. And I'm not saying you can't go to a Chiefs game because I may go one in a couple weeks. But I'm saying that we got to be careful. Things stop becoming a priority. Things stop becoming important. And you drift from the body of Christ. And you're hurting all alone. And that's where the enemy wants you. I was watching the Discovery Channel. I like to watch that from every once in a while. And, and, and they were talking about sharks. At the very end of one of the broadcasts, a dude held up like a half-eaten fake fish. And he was like, it's just like we thought. It's just like we thought. The fish that swim alone, those are the ones the sharks attack. The fish that swim alone, the fish that were all together, the sharks didn't mess with them. But this fish was by himself. And look at him. He got destroyed. And that's what the enemy does to us. He wants you to swim alone. He wants you to get off by yourself, say you don't need anybody, I got Jesus, I'm good, and he can just attack you. He can just ravage you and destroy you. Colossians 4.2 says, continue steadfastly, devotion in prayer. Be watchful in prayer with thanksgiving. So, so have an attitude of gratitude when you're praying. Ephesians 6.18, talking to the whole church. Prayer at all times in the spirit with power, with prayer at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So we must commit to believing together and enduring together in prayer as a group of people. We must commit to believing together and enduring together as a people. It breaks my heart that y'all would rather be around me than each other. It breaks my heart that when somebody new comes here, you don't look to invite them to somebody else in this church. You look to try to invite them to me. I'm a nobody. I'm a normal human being. I'm just as nuts as most of you in here. Glory to God. <laughs> and it's not about me. It's not about me. People don't need me. They need the body of Christ. They need the body. And if we're not careful, we turn charismatic pastors who are funny and who can say things the right way into functional messiahs. And it becomes pretty stupid. It gets weird. So I wanna challenge you, who are you with praying and believing together with? Who are you enduring in prayer with? Who are you praying with? Who's in your circle? Who are you believing and enduring and praying with? And then I want to know, if you don't have anybody, it's this, this simple. You invite them in. You just invite them in. This is critical that we learn to do this. And then when we're doing it, we know 
that God hears us. We can be confident that God hears us. It's the coolest thing on the planet. In the beginning was God. The in the beginning God hears you. We don't deserve it. We're not entitled to it. He just does. I'll leave you with this. Psalms 109.4. This is for the teenagers. The adults can ignore it. In, my, in return for my love, they accuse me. This is David talking. But I gave myself to prayer. So teenagers, David was in a situation where he had a bunch of haters. They were talking about him. They were making fun of him. They were actually chasing him down, trying to kill him. And he said, while they were hating, I gave my life to prayer. While they were talking about me, I gave my life to prayer. The more they hate me, the more I pray. The more they talk about me, the more I pray. The more they despise me, the more I pray. The more they make false, false accusations against me, the more I pray. The more the haters bring it, the more the prayer I bring it. I'm going to match every type of hateful thought with a prayerful thought because God hears me. I'm his child, and he will answer. He will answer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We even thank you for the different things that we're facing that were unplanned in our hearts and our minds because we know that you're the great big God who works out everything. Give us a passion for prayer this morning. Give us a notion for prayer this morning. Give us some type of empowerment that helps us to understand that talking to you recalibrates our hearts, recalibrates our minds, and sets everything right in our hearts. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for the gift of prayer. In your mighty name I pray.